October 17, 1989, San Francisco's Loma Prieta earthquake registered 6.9 on the Richter scale. There were 63 casualties. February 27, 2010, the Chilean earthquake registered 8.8, .8, killing over 700 people. January 12, 2010, an earthquake struck Haiti, registering 7.0, about the same size as the Loma Prieta. Yet, almost a quarter of a million people lost their lives. The question is, why? We talked to Lisa Faulkner, founder of Children's Hope and a longtime Haiti advocate. Why is the devastation so much worse in Haiti than would have literally happened anywhere else in the world? That's the real story, and that's the story that hasn't really been told. Pierre Labossiere is the founder of the Haiti Action Committee and one of the leading Haitian activists in the U.S. Now, when you hear people talk about Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, and they stop it right there, right? You read the press, you hear it all the time. Then you wonder, then they don't tell you exactly, you know, what's going on behind it. So, in our minds, we say, wow. We see so many examples. What they say, black people can't govern themselves. Blacks are inferior. Blacks can't make it. So, you tend to deduce from there that, well, you know, country of blacks, what do you expect? They couldn't govern themselves. Most folks like to think about Haiti as uh, this poor, impoverished, backward people. And, you know, it could be that racism has, has some large part to play in that. Because it, none of that really is uh, at the essence of the truth. The first European University was in Haiti. The first cathedral was in Haiti. Uh, it was the wealthiest colony in the entire world. And it was very systematically um, uh, drained of all of its natural resources, starting with its very humanity. 50% of the children are malnourished. One third of all children will never turn five. Why? Why is Haiti so poor? Television evangelist Pat Robertson offers his explanation. They were under the heel of the French, uh, you know, Napoleon III and whatever. And they got together and swore a pact to the devil. In case you didn't buy that explanation, meet Paul Burke, Latin American scholar and professor at Sacramento State University. Haiti is a poor nation because Haiti's an exploited nation. Um, it goes back to the, um, the French colonial period when Haiti was France's the jewel of the French Empire. The people of Haiti came together, they had their first congress, and they united and pledged to defeat slavery, to rise up, and fight a war of independence. And after 12 years, they succeeded in defeating the troops of Napoleon. This was major. Napoleon's army fought desperately to hold on to Haiti. But Toussaint Louverture, the Haitian independence leader, defeated Napoleon's army. Haiti became the first free black republic in the world uh, back in 1804. Haiti really set the example uh, with the slave revolution. It was historic. It was monumental. It literally shook the world when Haiti uh, rejected slavery and uh, had the successful slave revolution. It was so challenged, for example, U.S. hegemony, that for over 60 years, the United States would not recognize Haiti. That means wouldn't trade with Haiti. Uh, France refused to trade with Haiti. The other thing that Haiti did that not enough people know about is that after Haiti won its own independence, the first thing it did was to support Simon Bolivar and the independence movements all over Latin America. And those probably would not have succeeded without Haitian support. So Haiti didn't just set an example in terms of liberating uh, its people from slavery and setting that example in the world that slaves could rebel against their masters. Haiti set an example for all folks who were oppressed, who faced colonialism. And for that reason, the powers that be in the world made Haiti pay, and they made Haiti pay dearly. Haiti became the place to be defeated. 
Haiti committed the greatest sin at that time. It called on enslaved people from wherever in the world they were to come to Haiti. And Haiti, they would receive political asylum, and they would receive Haitian citizenship, and Haiti would go to war to defend their freedom. That was a big blow to the world economic system that existed at the time, not only in the Caribbean, but all over the Americas. It was slavery. And so for a nation of enslaved people to rise up like that, man, that's a powerful example. Just think of it. The way that the world responded was to isolate Haiti and to bully Haiti and to try to make Haiti pay for its crime of rising up against slavery and white supremacy. The U.S. and France were not the only countries. Spain threatened to invade Haiti, Germany, Holland. The U.S. and Great Britain and other, other of the uh, Western industrial, you know, uh, significant powers all pretty much ganged up on Haiti. Haiti was by itself completely isolated, completely. It's nice to think romantically that, oh, we probably would support the Haitian independence struggle because in many ways it was modeled after our own. But that's the opposite because what people tend to forget is that during that period that the United States was run by mostly slave owners, people like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, for all their courage, all their brilliance, they were also slave owners and they were committed to the doctrine of white supremacy and committed to slavery. And Haiti's revolution threatened all that. So the U.S. was very hostile to Haiti, and in fact, the United States didn't even recognize Haiti as an independent country until Abraham Lincoln did it, uh, more than a half century later, uh, after the Civil War, or during the Civil War. With these countries um, threatening constant invasion, Haiti didn't really have an opportunity to recoup, especially from the losses it was forced to pay. Probably the most important event happened in 1825, when France came back, kind of regrouped, right, this is 20 years later, Haiti's been a free nation state. But uh, France came back and threatened to reinvade Haiti, to reoccupy it, and to reenslave the people. And they said, basically, either you pay us an extortion fee of what is now about $22 billion in today's money, or we're going to take you back. There were warships circling. Haiti a year after year following the revolution. Haiti was weak enough that it really didn't want to go through another war. It had been a 13-year war. They lost, you know, a, a large percentage of their population was killed during the war. So they decided to pay the fee. Haiti was forced to pay to France the equivalent of $21.7 billion in today's money. Forced to pay that money to France in reparations because the former slave owners had lost their property. What was their property? Our foremothers and fathers. They wanted all the profit from the slaves that they weren't able to sell. The slaves that had found their own freedom. A freedom that wasn't a reality for American slaves, not for many years to come. In order for Haiti to pay the extortion fee to France, they had to shut down all their public schools. So when people talk about Haiti being underdeveloped, when they talk about uh, the, the high illiteracy rates in Haiti, and they're very high, Liter Iller illiteracy rates are uh, somewhere around 70%, and that's because they haven't had public schools since 1825. Monies that should have gone into the building of Haiti, monies that should have gone into building schools, building irrigation ditches, building, uh, providing things to build the, the society, building a healthcare system, went into paying France. So it really goes back to that period to understand why Haiti today is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It took um, over a century for Haiti to be able to finally pay off the debt that was extracted, really blackmailed. Unfortunately, when we get closer to 2010, the story actually gets worse, not better. Because finally, in 1990, the Haitian people had a chance for the first time in their nation's history to elect their first free uh, president in a, in a free democratic election. They managed to get a priest, a priest that grew up in the poor part of Haiti himself and really understood the people. They talked him into running. His name was Jean Bertrand Aristide. He had earned reputation for being a dedicated advocate for the poor. 
despite the fact that there was many candidates, despite the fact that the United States had one in particular, Mark Bazan, who they wanted to win and gave a lot of funding to, uh, Aristide won easily. He got, I think, 67% of the vote back in 1990. In the, the fall of 1991, uh, George Bush Sr. and other nefarious forces overthrew Aristide along with the Haitian military and the Haitian elite, and they uh, in implemented a military coup. Aristide was forced from power, but in 2000 he ran for president again. And even though he had only served, you know, total about two years out of his five-year term, it was clear that the people were thrilled with what he had tried to do in, the, in that time, because when he ran for president uh, in 2000, he got more than 90 percent of the vote. And international observers watched the election very carefully. The U.S. was, was looking for any excuse to delegitimize uh, Aristide's reelection. But it was a free and fair election. It wasn't so popular with the power elite, not only in Haiti, but in the world's community. So twice he was subject to military coups that overthrew both of these free elections. And now he's in exile. First, the Clinton administration uh, went after him and started to uh, create kind of an economic blockade of Haiti. And then when George Bush uh, Jr. took over, then he continued it and intensified the campaign to destabilize the Aristide government. Haitians had it written in their constitution that only Haitian nationals could own property. And yet when the U.S. invaded Haiti and, uh, and occupied Haiti, uh, then that was, that was done away with. So it opened the door, it opened every door, opened every door and every window to, um, to the world really sucking the life out of Haiti. Eventually, it led to the coup of uh, February 29, 2004, which is a day of infamy uh, in Haiti, but for the world, because once again, the will of the Haitian people was violated, and the democratic election of 2000 was overthrown when George Bush sent the Marines in to overthrow their president. You have a puppet government put in there by the U.S. According to the Haitian constitution, someone must have lived in Haiti for five years before you can become a prime minister. This guy left Haiti 18 years ago. He lives in Boca Raton, Florida. He was put on the plane and made prime minister by the US. And his name is Gérard Latortue. He was put in there to be prime minister. First thing he did, he told the French, we are so sorry. Harris is a crazy man. Haiti has no claim against France. So he retracted the whole thing in terms of, um, you know, the repayment by friends of the money they took from us. After all that the Haitian people have been through, now they're trying to grapple with the earthquake. The French Revolution, the American Revolution before the French Revolution, and uh, the Haitian Revolution. The first two are very well known and talked about and celebrated in movies and what have you. But the Haitian Revolution is hardly talked about. Whenever we meet with the media on these different levels, as soon as we start talking about why conditions are the way they are in Haiti, then uh, the camera goes off and all of a sudden we're out of time. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. Hmm. It's a true story.